Good morning and welcome to Birding Basics. My name is Carolyn Knight. I am the Education and Outreach Specialist for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And today in Birding Basics, we're going to be talking about feeders. Bird feeders in spe <laughs> specifically. Um, now, these are one of the most reliable ways to attract birds to your yard, uh, to your home. Uh, they're really easy to get access to. There's a lot of information available about them so that you can most effectively try and attract the specific types of birds that you're looking for to visit your yard. Now, it's important to note that the birds you're trying to attract are wild animals. Just because you have a feeder doesn't guarantee that the birds are going to come. And in large part, that may be because their habitat isn't really there to support them um, because not only do birds need food, but they also need water, they need shelter. Uh, if that's not there for them, they're not gonna come no matter how wonderfully appointed your feeder is. Uh, range is important to pay attention to. If you're trying to attract black capped chickadees and you're living in San Jose, um, I'm sorry, you're, you're not gonna get them. Um, that simply isn't in their range. Uh, so, uh, if you're in California, don't try for cardinals. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's disappointing to all of us, but we don't have cardinals uh, here. Um, so do pay attention to those range maps of the birds that you're looking to attract. Um, make sure you're actually within that bird's range. I'm not saying that birds don't fly out of their ranges because once again, they're wild animals, they don't read the same books that we do, uh, but it's highly unlikely that you'll be able to get a bird outside of its range to visit your yard feeder. Now, today we're also going to be looking at different types of feeders, um, but before we move on to that, I also want to point out that the time of year is also going to impact who's using your feeder and how many birds you're seeing. In the springtime, birds need a lot of protein. They're producing eggs. They are being territorial. They're defending their territories. They're building nests. They need a ton of energy. The majority of our birds aren't going to be visiting seed feeders. Instead, they're going to be on the lookout hunting for insects, things that can give them protein and lots and lots of energy. So if you notice that there's a lull in birds visiting your feeder at a certain time of year, think about what part of their life they're going through right now. Are they preparing for a migration? Are they building nests and producing eggs? Um, all of these things can impact whether or not you've got birds visiting your feeder. That doesn't mean the birds aren't in the area. It just means that their dietary requirements have changed. So don't worry if you're suddenly noticing that there aren't birds visiting your feeders. It's just the time of year. The seasons change, the birds' behaviors change. So, starting out with our feeders, we're going to take a look at the, the standard feeder here. Um, more often than not, we're filling these feeders with a mixture of seeds, uh, different types of millet, safflower occasionally, uh, sunflower seeds, whether they're hulled or still have their, um, their outer hulls attached. Uh, it's up to you. The birds really don't care, um, but sometimes mess is a concern. Now, these are going to be attracting your standard songbirds, things like your sparrows, uh, your finches, chickadees. All of these will come to these feeders. Um, this is a really good way to just start out. Uh, you'll get your standard yard birds in. Um, it'll give you a little bit of an idea of what's in your area. Uh, and it's your general use feeder. Uh, the majority of birds are going to visit it. Um, you're also, of course, going to see issues with squirrels if you've got a lot of squirrels in your area. In fact, squirrels will try and raid most feeders with the exception of hummingbird feeders because they're just not interested in nectar. Um, so there's a couple of different ways you can get around that. Um, there's been some really fantastic um, shelter-in-place era photography um, in which people are taking advantage of the fact that the squirrels will do pretty much anything for things like seeds or peanuts. Um, just 
creating incredibly ridiculous setups for the squirrels to get through in order to steal the seed or the nuts that were originally intended for birds. Now there are feeders that are intentionally designed to foil squirrels. Oftentimes this has to do with the amount of weight that gets put on the feeders. Um, they have springs inside so if anything above a certain weight lands on the feeder, uh, whether it's an overly large jay or a squirrel or a rat, um, the feeder itself pulls closed. Now something that's smaller like a house finch or a sparrow doesn't trigger that, it doesn't close off the feeder so your birds that you're trying to attract are still going to be able to get to it. Uh, but it is something to look into. They tend to be a little bit more expensive, uh, but it can be worth it. And the first couple of weeks that you've got that feeder in place, the squirrels are still going to try, um, and it can be really funny to watch them fall off of it. Um, baffles are another strategy to keep the squirrels off your feeder. Usually these look like half domes uh, that are just suspended above your feeder. They simply form a barrier to prevent the squirrels from dropping down or jumping directly onto your feeder. Um, and there are also strategies like the use of pepper uh, to prevent squirrels from even being interested in it. Birds don't register the heat of things like red pepper flakes. Um, doesn't bother them at all, doesn't do them any harm, uh, but mammals register that heat. Uh, so things like rats and squirrels, with you know a few individual exceptions, um, are completely put off by the taste, um, and they will avoid, to a certain extent, uh, your seed and things like suet. So, past the standard feeder, which will give you your standard songbirds visiting your yard, uh, the peanut feeder is another really good one to have. Now. This is one that the squirrels are definitely going to try and get into, so I do recommend looking into um, a squirrel-resistant feeder. Um, otherwise, they're going to try and run off with it. They love peanuts. Um, they're full of fat and very high in energy. It's a great food for the birds. It's also a great food for the squirrels. Uh, so unless you want your feeder completely emptied out by the squirrels, uh, you do have to put some precautions in place. But these feeders are really great if you have things like chickadees, woodpeckers, nuthatches, all of these are going to be attracted to these feeders. Uh, so this can be really great if you're just trying to get a little bit of variety into your yard birds. Niger feeders are another common feeder type. Uh, now Niger seed is a small black thistle seed. So a Niger feeder is going to have significantly smaller openings in it than a standard seed feeder or a peanut feeder. Um, it mostly attracts finches, uh, and goldfinches especially. Now here in the Bay Area we've got three species, three species of goldfinches, uh, Lesser American and Lawrence's. They're all gorgeous. Um, they can all be, to a certain extent, considered yard birds, um, though you're probably going to have the best luck getting American and lesser goldfinches to your yard. Now the suet feeders one I mentioned, the majority of suet feeders just look like cages, um, and the reason for that is suet comes in a block form. Now suet itself is kind of gross. It's rendered animal fat for the most part, um, but it's very high in protein energy. Um, oftentimes it's mixed with things like seed, peanuts, um, parts of insects. Now suet is a really great resource to, to provide for your local birds. It's great um, in terms of energy. It's very high calorie, so it's, it's quality food for them. Uh, it attracts a wider variety of birds, so you're going to have things like wrens, uh, the chickadees, the woodpeckers coming to your suet feeder, uh, but it also means it's very attractive for squirrels as well, um, and rats. Now, uh, at McClellan Ranch, we've got a couple of suet feeders up. They're f very commonly frequented by our many woodpeckers, um, but we actually ended up having to zip tie 
uh, at least one of the suet feeders to its hook because the squirrels would just carry the entire thing off, uh, block and all. Uh, so it's it's a very tempting target for those rodents. Um, you do have to put some precautions in, but they do sell suet that's actually uh, made with the hot pepper already in it. Uh, so that can discourage, you know, the, those, those fluffy-tailed visitors that just try and run off with the entire block of suet. And they will attempt that, um, which, as funny as that is, you don't want to put out food to attract the birds and then just have a squirrel run off with the whole thing. Um, it's a little, little frustrating. Uh, suet feeders do take a little while uh, for the birds to notice them. So you may put one out and then watch nothing happen for a couple weeks uh, before the birds realize it's there, but once it's there, they will keep coming back to it throughout the year. Hummingbird feeders are another good one to have. Uh, doesn't take up a lot of space. They don't create any mess uh, at all, which is an issue with the seed feeders, uh, the hulls of seeds dropping to the ground. Uh, which can attract, you know, rodents, um, you're concerned about things like mold. With a hummingbird feeder, it's really well contained. Hummingbirds aren't messy for whatever other sins they may have with regards to their behavior. Um, now, a hummingbird feeder is going to be filled with nectar. Um, it's a four parts water, one part sugar mixture. You can make it yourself. Don't add any food coloring. You don't need to. Um, and what you do is you just fill it up and the hummingbirds will come. Uh, they're attracted to the red color. Uh, you can also occasionally get orioles visiting your hummingbird feeders, and that's always a very strange look because while a hummingbird is yay big, it, an oriole is the size of a robin, roughly. Um, so that's that always creates a big ruckus. Um, cleaning your feeders is an important consideration if you're going to be putting them out. Uh, it's recommended to clean bird feeders every two weeks or so, just to prevent the buildup of mold or bacteria. Um, you don't want your neighborhood feeders to suddenly be the cause of a salmonella or a pox outbreak in your local birds. Um, Birds can be prone to that, uh, sp especially birds like finches. Uh, so keeping your feeders clean means you are keeping your local birds healthy. And that simply involves emptying it out, washing it with soap and boiling water, or you can use a 10% bleach solution, rinse it out really well, let it dry completely, and then you can fill it up and hang it up again. It's not a ton of work, and it does mean that you're helping keep these birds healthy rather than inadvertently creating a health problem for them to deal with. Um, with hummingbirds, you should be replacing that nectar uh, every couple of days, uh, four to five days. Uh, it is sugar water, so you don't want to end up feeding uh, your hummingbirds what turns into fermented sugar water. Um, you want to make sure that the entryways to it where they're going to be sticking their beaks in and putting their tongues through to actually get to the liquid, making sure that doesn't have any mold in it. Uh, for, because once again, we don't want to inadvertently harm the birds that we're trying to help by feeding them. So one of the misconceptions uh, about bird feeders uh, and the act of feeding birds is that feeding birds will actually interfere with their migration. Uh, it doesn't. What it will do is it can actually help them build up the fat reserves they need in order to migrate. But if a bird is visiting your feeder and it's the winter time, it's because that bird lives there. Uh, so your feeder is not going to interfere with the migration schedule of these birds. Uh, you're simply providing them with a little bit more resources. And if you take a look at the habitat loss and the density that our birds have to exist in now, in terms of quality habitat where there is food, um, you can think of it as long as you're keeping it a clean and safe environment, um, it's more like you're mitigating at least some of the impact 
So if you keep your feeders clean, you're doing more good than harm. Now, today I want to talk about one of our yard birds that we frequently see visiting our feeders, um, both in your yard, pretty much wherever you're at, in Santa Clara County, as well as at McClellan Ranch, where Santa Clara Valley Audubon is located, and that is our chestnut-backed chickadee. Now, these birds are frequently visiting our bird feeders. If you take a look, you can see that chestnut back for which it's named. So that bright reddish brown coloration earns the, these guys their name. We've actually got three subspecies in the Bay Area, uh, and they're largely differentiated by the amount of that chestnut coloration extending down onto those flanks which is the part of the body just underneath those feather feathers. The majority of these birds' diet is made up of insects, but they do frequently feed on seeds as well, so you can in fact get them at your feeders. So here's a picture with those wings splayed, we can see that chestnut back to the full effect. And like our other chickadees, it's got that bright white cheek patch as well as a black throat and a black top of its skull, sort of like a cap. Um, we, we don't have black cap chickadees in Santa Clara County. Um, in order to find them in California, you have to be right on the Oregon border. Uh, so we are out of range for these little guys. But they are cavity nesters, and that makes them really interesting to watch. Uh, they will use nest boxes, they will make use of natural holes in trees where a branch fell off. Um, they'll also utilize the old woodpecker holes left over from previous seasons. And what they'll do is they'll line those nests with soft material. Uh, they have a real preference for using shredded redwood bark. Um, so if you've got redwoods in your neighborhood, um, keep an eye out for these little birds. And they'll, they'll line it with pretty much anything. Uh, animal fur is a popular one. Uh, I've got a chestnut back chickadee nest in my backyard, and right now it is lined with the fur from my dog. Um, so it'll keep those babies nice and warm. And they've got a pretty great song. Now, if these birds are pretty vocal. Uh, they're very common visitors to our nest boxes. If you take part in the cavity, cavity nesters recovery program, um, they're often found in our nest boxes. And while most birds, when you check nest boxes, will fly away and hide, uh, these guys are pretty notable in that they will stick around and scold you from the branch. Uh, the entire time you're checking on their nest, uh, which is always pretty amusing because they are absolutely tiny, uh, but they are just filled with rage. And of course, you you close the box up and you move on because you've you've checked the status of the nest. You maybe counted the eggs if there are any in there, and the entire time, uh, either mom or dad, uh, because both parents are involved in in feeding the babies, um, keeping the nest. Um, they'll just scold you from the top of the branch the entire time, uh, which is, is pretty endearing, actually. So, that ends our beginning, uh, our birding basics for this week. I hope you all have a really great weekend. Uh, stay safe, and I'll see you next week.